fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the House of Mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro. David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren. on FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the House of Mystery. I'm Al Warren. It's, it's going to be a dangerous show today. Everyone put your seatbelts on because Gavin Stone is my co-host today. Well, hey, thank <laughs> you for having me back. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a rough ride because you're here, I know. Uh, well, do you, well, do you guys, hey, you know, did you, do you watch the, any of the award shows like the Grammys or any of that stuff over there? Or just, do people care in the UK? Um, I, I, some of them do. I don't if I can help it. I try and avoid TV at all costs if, if, if I can, unless there's something that really, that really kind of piques my interest, I, I avoid TV most of the time. Yeah. I keep getting caught off guard because these, uh, I also I start seeing clips online about someone at the Grammys did something to someone else, and I'm thinking, oh, there was the Grammys. <laughs> something happened. I, I used to watch them years ago. I guess I got old. Yeah, I think um, I think there's so much now that's probably scripted. I'm not saying it all is, but I think there's a lot of things that happen which is prearranged. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no doubt. And uh, it it doesn't matter. I think it's just funny anyway, you know. Mm. But we're going to find out. Uh, you brought one of your uh, friends on who's a guest today, yeah. and uh, she's going to give us the honest answers. So, mm. uh, Lena Sisko, thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Well, it's a pleasure because I need to know the truth. Are we living in the truth or is this everything a lie? Is it like a segment like, you know, what, what's his face, you know, that uh, Neo, you know, are we all living in a... Oh, Fantasy. in the Matrix? Yeah. Are we in a Matrix? I think we might be in a Matrix, but I'm going to give you techniques today that you will be able to use to decipher truth from deception, and you can get out of the Matrix. But how do we know that you're really not part of the Matrix trying to fool us? Yeah, you might have to wait until the end to figure that one out. <laughs> well, what got you into this kind of, and I say career, or kind of, business or I, I'm not sure how you want to term it, but how, how did you get into body language and conversations and things like this? It was not planned. Uh, it fell in my lap. I tell people I had intentions of becoming the next Indiana Jones. I wanted to become an archaeologist and I did. I actually got my master's degree from Brown University in old world archaeology and art. And after I graduated, I didn't have a job. So my dad was like, um, what are you going to do? You need to get a job and, you know, go off on your own, and make some money. So I had a friend say, hey, why don't you join the Navy Reserves? And I laughed at him. Because I thought, why? Why would I do that? Um, I have no military background. Um, no one in my family is big into the military. And I talked to him and he said, well, you could be James Bond instead of Indiana Jones and do all this really super cool intelligence work and spy stuff. And I was sold. So I thought, you know, that sounds like a lot of fun. Oh, and, and the bonus, they were going to pay me. So, yeah, shortly after I was raising my hand. I got sworn in. I got in as a very lowly E3. I didn't know what that meant, so that meant nothing to me, and I was happier than anything. And I went through my reserve training, and it wasn't until I was stationed at my first duty station, which was the Office of Naval Intelligence at the War College in Newport, Rhode Island, and I had a commander come up to me and said, hey, Seaman Cisco, we have this great opportunity that the first time ever – females are going to be allowed to do this training and the first time that your lowly rank is going to be allowed to do the training and the first time that a Navy reservist is going to be allowed to go through this training. And I said, well, sir, what's the training? He said, IPW. And I said, what is that? And he said, interrogation, prisoners of war. And I was like, ooh, I, I don't know about that. He's like, well, the Marines are going to come over and talk to us today. And after listening to them, let me know what you think. So I listened to the Marines that afternoon. It was a Saturday afternoon. 
at the War College. And after listening to them, I went to the commander and I said, sir, thank you so much for thinking of me and thinking I could do this, but no thank you. And I went home that night and I beat myself up because I thought this was a challenge. I don't know if I can succeed at it. I don't know if I'm going to be good. So Sunday morning, I found the commander and I said, you know what, sir, sign me up. I'll try it. I'll see what happens. And that decision is what got me to where I am today. I love what I do. Um, and I love teaching people how to do it because my whole goal is my why is if I can teach you the techniques that I use, you're going to be able to make better choices in life to protect yourself, protect your friends, your finances, the people you hire. Any wise decision that you have coming up, you're going to make it wisely, better, knowing what to look for and what to listen for. So that's my story. Wow. IPW, interior public washroom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or that. <laughs> or that, yeah. But, you know, can anyone do this? Like, you know, quite often you know, people say, I want to be a writer or I want to mm. be a singer. I want to be whatever. And it's all good to jump in and say, yeah, and some people can just do it and some can't. So is this something that anybody can really learn or pick up? Yes, I, I truly believe it is. Now, as a female, right, my brain has 14 more areas than the male brain of deciphering and picking up on these nonverbals, but it doesn't mean that I'm going to be better than a man. Um, if you're highly intuitive, if you're a people person, this is going to come easy to you. However, anybody with any personality type or background can be really proficient at using these skills. So, Gavin, you have hope. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, We're um, trying with him. That's it. I, I would say, if, if I can learn it, anybody can. <laughs> Do you look for certain things in people that, um, you know, I, I guess, how do I frame this? When you when you meet someone and you're talking about being a master negotiator or picking up unheard things, you know, or you know what I mean, when you're kind of being mm -hmm. perceptive, is, is there certain things you look for immediately when you meet someone? Yes. Um, openness, number one, because if I'm having a conversation with you, I want you to be open and honest with me. I also want to know if you're comfortable around me, because if you're comfortable, then you're more apt to trust me and then be open with me. So I look at your body language to see how you're standing, any postures, any gestures that say you're on guard or you're not on guard. So typically, if you have people that are real balled up and crossing their arms in front of them, or maybe slumping shoulders or blading their body toward you. That's not a good indicator that you trust me or like me. But if I have somebody that's relaxed, their shoulders are back and drop down, um, they're not covering up their power zones in the body, we have three of them, and they have good eye contact leaning in towards me, then that tells me you probably feel very comfortable with me and around me, and then we can have a connection rapport, and of course that will be conducive to some honest communication. So when someone, when when you feel and see someone being really uncomfortable with you when you meet them, and you know they got their arms up and crossed and they're kind of being maybe even aggressive to a scent, uh, standoffish. Now that's a good word. Good mm -hmm. way to say it. Yeah. So what 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 do you do? Do you just walk away from that, or what can you do to alleviate that? How can you break through through that, so to speak? Oh, there's always a way through. Never walk away, especially if your goal is to have this person trust you and like you and be willing to talk to you. So you can use a couple of techniques, both verbal and nonverbal. Number one, I always say set the stage for how you want this other person to be around you or respond to you. So if I want this other person to be open, I have to be open. So that means I need to check in with how I'm coming across, both verbally and nonverbally. Maybe I am giving a signal that I can't be trusted because I have my arms crossed or because I'm standing a certain way. Maybe I said something and the perception was that I was withholding information. So I'm constantly, right, it all starts with self-awareness. You have to be aware of how you sound and how you look to know if you're creating an environment where people will feel comfortable with you. So that's step number one. 
Step number two, if I still have a little bit of aggression coming towards me, then I'm going to open the conversation and focus it all on them. And I'm going to show them interest. And I'm going to find a way to find common ground with you in a very sincere way, right, not embellished. And that's going to start chipping away at that iceberg slowly because I don't want to rush you or the conversation. I have to be very patient when I'm trying to gain people's trust and build that rapport. Lena, I've worked with you and known you for years and years and years, and, and I keep forgetting to say this bit more or less at the beginning. Yeah. People get uh, uh, conjure up all sorts of images whenever we say the word interrogation. Oh. Um, so I know, yeah. <laughs> um, in fact, I'm not even going to go on what, what recently happened with a, a trip to Europe. Um, but uh, but yeah, you, there, there was something that was cancelled because of uh, just because of the words interrogation. Do you remember? Oh, but, I remember. Um, <laughs> yes, I certainly do. Can we can we kind of put it out there for a little bit uh, for all the people that that hear the word interrogation and are hearing things like waterboarding or or mm. nails through the toes or hammers and, <laughs> and, and all the torture devices that they're thinking that we're probably using when you say the word interrogation? Oh, do you want to know what I used? I used <laughs> mint tea, Harry Potter books. That's what I used. Um, interrogation. It's a funny word. So yes, I am a former interrogator, and I loved every minute of it. I created a technique. It's a rapport-based strategic interviewing technique, non-accusatory, because that's exactly what I did every single day as an interrogator. So when people say, you know, interrogation, you guys waterboarded. Well, let's back up the story. First of all, um, I was an interrogator, and I will tell you right now, we didn't. So there you have it, right? And, of course, I was a DOD, Department of Defense interrogator. So what CIA did back in the day, I can't speak for. But I can definitely speak for what Department of Defense certified interrogators did and how they're trained because everything we do is in accordance with Geneva Convention. And we all know that you attract more bees with honey than vinegar, right? Rapport works. That's the bottom line. The other thing is an interrogation is simply a conversation. That is it. You can call it an interview, you can call it an interrogation, or you can call it a conversation. Because my whole goal as an interrogator is to get the truth. That's it. And how do I get the truth? I get it through rapport building tactics. I get it through questioning techniques. I can get it through elicitation. All of those techniques, but my whole end result is to get you to feel comfortable with me, open up to me, and want to tell me the truth. Brilliant. Thank you. I love that. At least clears that up for one or two people who may be on the, uh, that may have the wrong idea of the whole thing. So, um, yes. I, I know that there's some fantastic stories and, and there's so many that I'd love to share. But, um, what I'm going to do, going to concentrate on elicitation because I know it's, it's like kind of both yours and mine kind of favorite area mm -hmm. and topic. Um, so for the people who don't know, um, for, for those who aren't spies or don't read much, uh, in the way of spy stories, what's elicitation? So elicitation is this. Are you ready? It's really simple. It's a technique, a conversational technique, to get information without asking a question. So as a trained interrogator, questions were my bread and butter, right? I ask questions all the time. But sometimes when you're asking people questions, it can get exhausting and it can make them on guard. And so change your tactic a little bit. Have a conversation with them instead. And this way, their guard drops and they feel more comfortable. But the intent behind elicitation is that I'm still guiding that conversation to the information I need to collect. And I'm also keeping rapport and making the other person feel more comfortable. And this is funny, Gab, because even though there's so many stories about interrogation and Gitmo, I will tell people this. As an interrogator in Gitmo, I got invited back to meet families of most of my detainees. I was invited back to meet the family, to have dinner, to do this, to do that. Now, I never took, on, took any offer, but I was invited back to these countries to meet their families. So when I tell you that rapport is key, that's really the whole foundation for a good conversation and getting the truth. Well, and I just want to check that. that you said that elicitation with yes. an A? Oh, with okay. an E. I, I, with an E. I mm -hmm. thought you meant solicitation. Um, yeah, no. <laughs> well, Some now, people now do. I'm, I'm up for that. <laughs> Here I go. That is very different. Yeah, that, that's that's, that's another that. part of our career. <laughs> 
Yeah, so um, cause, uh, you, you went on from naval intel intelligence uh, to, to the training side of things, and then and now, I mean, uh, you know, you have your own company, you teach government departments and a lot of the three-letter agencies and a lot of this stuff as well, mm -hmm. and, and you're doing this for, for private clients as well, aren't you? Yes, absolutely. For business leaders primarily, if you are a business owner, entrepreneur, C-suite, and you are in charge of the success of your company, you need to be making wise decisions. Um, you need to be leading your leaders and your employees, right? Because you want a healthy work environment, but you also want to attract the perfect clients and customers and make sure that your business is prospering. So the only way to do that is really to hone in your human intelligence skills. So although I've used them in the military intelligence world, they are so applicable into the business world because every single day you are having a conversation with another human. Yeah, and I, I've said so many times, questions are dead because at the mm -hmm. end of the day, you ask questions, people get their guard up, and it, and it turns mm -hmm. into what you know. They're like, "Why is he interrogating me? What's with all the questions?" And this is whether whether it's anything from dating to, like you say, oh, C-suite yeah. executives. You know, the whole thing. If you're going down the route of questions, it it, it has a negative connotation. Whereas elicitation, it's it's brilliant because you're provoking an answer from that person, getting them to converse and open up to you. So, yeah. I love that. Now, yeah. Do you do you mention this in your book, Honest Answers? Of course I do. So Honest Answers, I focus into three categories, right? It's the interviewing techniques, which is your questions, because you need questions. We can't ever truly get rid of them. I mean, they, they're valuable. But at some point, it's just what you said, you want to make sure you're maintaining that healthy relationship with this client, your stakeholder. So you may not want to be firing off 20 questions at them. So make it more into a conversation, and then I'll teach you these elicitation techniques and honest answers. And I also will teach you some negotiation techniques as well. Brilliant. And what if you find the conversations go in a particular way where, you know, it's going into an area you don't like? Yeah, all you have to do is steer it, right? I call it pivoting a conversation. So elicitation will allow you to do that because when you don't ask a question, people assume you're not after anything. But if I just say a provocative statement, then naturally I can direct that conversation anywhere I want it to go. And you're not saying, well, why did she say that? Why did she ask that? It's a natural, unassuming way to control a conversation. So the old technique of, um, you know, throwing you in a dark room and putting a light in your eyes. <laughs> That's kind of not any good anymore. Yeah, it's a little old. It's a little antiquated. Yeah, we've evolved from that technique. I kind of, I was kind of liking the idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can do that for you, Alan. If you would like that done, you just let me know. <laughs> yeah, I was just like, so when when you're saying that, like, um, elicitation, mm -hmm. ooh, new word, getting excited. Yeah. yeah. So when you when you do that, so is it more just actions that create? the communication or is there actually you just sort of say something that gets them to react and then they start speaking and then you kind of take it from there that's it it's the latter so every elicitation technique I teach 15 of them and some Alan if I were to say right now you'd be like oh I know that and what it is it's a provocative statement so it provokes people to want to respond typically people are either going to agree with what I just said disagree with it, or offer up and share in kind, is what we say. So quid pro quo, I'm sure you've heard of that. Most of your listeners have heard of that. It just means, you know, this for that. So a natural, good, easy example of quid pro quo is when you meet somebody. When you meet someone, you say, hi, I'm Lena. What do they do next? They share their name, right? So it's when I share information about a particular subject, it provokes the other person to share about that same subject. So now, knowing that, you can see how you can direct a conversation because all I really have to do is start introducing a topic and sharing information about it, which will provoke you to want to share information about it as well. And then, poof, all of a sudden, we are on that topic. Well, you know, um, in, the, in the last 10 years, um, in general, in public, Especially with social media, there's a lot of um, a lot of this going on. <laughs> but there's a lot of because because there's a lot of people that have ideas that they're given or they're provoked into to thinking mm 
mm. by misinformation or disinformation or sometimes just whatever. It, it doesn't even matter if it's real. Yeah. How, how can you tell the difference? Is there, is there, you know what I'm saying? If you're, you're, you're this person and you do this kind of technique and you work in this area, do you, do, can you screen a person when they're giving you false information? Oh, absolutely. So there's a lot going on with what you just said. Number one is, you know, all those ads on Instagram, I fall victim to them all the time, right? Because I see something and how the picture is what I want and I expect the results and it just entices me to buy, right? It's almost like subliminal messaging. Now, some people may say, well, if you're using a licitation and you are getting information without people knowing, well, you must be manipulating them. Mm, no, absolutely not. And even the clients that I teach to use a licitation, I will say, listen, if that is your goal, go somewhere else. <laughs> you're not a client for me. Because what a licitation does is it makes people feel comfortable and safe opening up. And so that's the brilliance of this conversation. The fact that I am purposely guiding it to topics I want to talk about, well, that just makes me a conversational master. Because in doing so, I'm still making sure you feel comfortable with me. And if you're not, then I have to figure out how to do that. And as this conversation's ensuing, now I have to tap into another technique, another um super skill that we have, our super sleuth skills, which is statement analysis, right? And I always tell people, if you want to vet the accuracy of the information someone's giving you, you have to split your attention in two. You have to focus on their nonverbals and you have to focus on their verbals, what they look like and what they're saying. And if they match up and they're congruent, then you probably have a truthful person on your hand. And if they're incongruent and something doesn't make sense, then you have to investigate a little deeper. What about someone like me who never looks in the mirror? I don't know what I look like. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's okay, as long as I can look at you. <laughs> so if oh, I yeah. can look at you and I notice everything about, you know, your baseline, how you act right now when you're comfortable, when you're relaxed. But if anything changes from that baseline, then it just says, hey, it could be a warning sign. Make sure you ask questions about this one topic where his baseline behaviors changed. Fifteen techniques that she teaches, but my, my favorite is um, the need to correct. Mm -hmm. And if you want to know how powerful this is, if you put a question on a forum, you know, especially, well, it doesn't matter what, what topic it's related to, but if you put a question on a forum, most people will ignore it. But if you put a question on a forum and then you go into a second account or somebody, your brother's account or something, and you answer that question wrong, you say, this is the right way to do it, deliberately being incorrect, you watch how many people all of a sudden will gang up on telling you the right way. Uh, the, the, it's a hugely powerful technique. Uh, we, we've tested all of them several times, and, and it's phenomenal, and, and it's amazing how it works. The, the information that, uh, that can be got is, is, is unbelievable. So um, yeah. I, I wanted to kind of express how powerful this stuff is. Well, all 15 techniques exploit the, the most common aspects of human psychology, which is, I, you know, people like to feel appreciated, needed. They also like to be right. And so, therefore, if we say something deliberately false, they're going to correct us. So that's kind of like I've been using that technique on social media for years now. <laughs> right? Yeah. I bet I you have. Up. Yeah. I put things up just for a reaction. Yeah. And... There you go. Mm -hmm. 100,000 followers later. <laughs> <laughs> you must be doing something right. <laughs> well, you know, I always post and walk away. I don't hang out. That's, mm. that's you know, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, let them all go at it and then do it all over the next day. <laughs> <laughs> I like that technique. <laughs> well, because it's, it's just it's all about the influence, the algorithm, how many people are re it, responding. Yes, it is. moves you up. So, yeah. But I'm not mean. I don't put up mean stuff except for, for <laughs> Gavin <laughs> well, yeah, <there's> that. <laughs> yeah. Gavin doesn't mind no, except, I'll, I'll okay. you know he, he <laughs> actually enjoys the beatings you know? <laughs> so uh, what do you do with someone like uh, that's um, autistic on the spectrum is it mm. still something you can work with and the reason I can say this is because I am on the spectrum and yeah. and autistic and this this gives me a, a lot of issues with myself and communications, especially in live, 
That's quite often why I don't like using cameras on Zoom or going to events. I do, like I will be doing, but it's not something I'm really thrilled with. I've learned to work with that. So how can you read someone with issues like I've got? And I've got a lot. (laughs) Well, so you baseline, right? And I mentioned that earlier. So when I get to know you, Alan, even though I'll Maybe I never see you and I just hear you. I get a sense of how you sound. I get a sense of how you speak. I get a sense of how you kick off a question. I just get a natural sense of who you are and how you act, right, your behaviors. And so regardless if you're on the spectrum or if you've got, you know, um, an anxiety issue, I will notice that all in your baseline. And then from that, I still will look for the deviations and meaning that you become, so say if you're just a normally anxious person and at one point in our conversation you really start to get you know anxious that anxiety goes through the roof or all of a sudden you're calm and I haven't seen that before so that's just a change in our behavior now our thoughts drive our behaviors so it tells me if I see a change in behavior then it must be you're thinking different thoughts and so as an interviewer my goal is to find out why the thoughts have changed and what those are And that comes with a good conversation. But like to what Gavin said, if I ask you questions about it, it may make you feel uncomfortable. It may make you feel like I just put you on the spot. So when I use elicitation instead, right, it makes you feel more comfortable to open up. I think because of when I grew up, you know, being born in the 60s, um, quite often I was always trying not to communicate. I I didn't understand why people sat around and talked. It didn't make sense (laughs) to me. Well, it doesn't make sense to me. Like you have people in a room and they're talking about things that really uh, are not important. And uh, as a young youngster, I did not understand that. So I remained quiet. Then the other thing I was always trying to do was to become the person nobody noticed Mm -hmm. in the room because that's what I wanted. I didn't want you to look at me or talk to me or directly look at me in the eyes. You know what I mean? That was the tough thing. And uh, it took a lot of years to kind of work around it. But it's still difficult, and I still find myself doing it, especially at live events, trying to figure out how to get out of there. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and if a person, you know, when they find that out about you, they're going to make sure that they create an environment, uh, a physical environment, an emotional environment, where you feel very comfortable. Because if they can't get you to be comfortable, you're probably not going to have that conversation with them. And over the years, what I've learned about myself was to find people that I have a trust in from just behaviors, just by Mm -hmm. how they act and Mm -hmm. react to other people, not even about myself. And so those are there. And what I do is then I get them as co-hosts. Yes. (laughs) Thanks. No, but it's it's a a lot. I, every 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 person I've had work with me on the show has been incredible, and I can, I can say I honestly love every one of them. And it's because of how how and who they are, especially with others. Just I don't know if that makes sense. Oh, it makes perfect sense. Yes, but that makes me in a safe place where I can do what I do. So I yes. respect that of them. But I I've learned to look for that. And that's kind of what I hang on to. So I'm always observing people. I'm a yeah. stalker. I love it. We, well, we all should be. Because how great would it be if we could surround ourselves with people that were, had in, you know, that had integrity, that had morals and ethics and made us feel good, made other people feel good. And sometimes we get duped. Right. Sometimes people take advantage of us and they will come into our lives, whether that's personally or professionally, and they have malicious intent. But we didn't see it or we didn't pick up on it. And that's where the harm comes. And that's why I've got 30 true crime murder books written. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Because I I spend. Well, you see, the the, the advantage of my um, being who I am is. I can focus incredible. I can I can just yeah. intently go to work, and I have no problem putting in 12, 16-hour days and working at it and really, really involving myself into things. And that's something that's I've been I've had since I can remember. So I take advantage of that. And so I you know I go out and kill people, and then I write about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm envious because I don't have that mindset. I am a Highly theoretical, conceptual, intuitive thinker, and my mind just, it's 
takes a lot of effort and work for me to have that focus for that long of a time span. <laughs> well, when you got this, but, and you've been through all of you've been through and, and even writing out the book, because when you write mm-hmm. out a book and write out the details of what you're doing in negotiation and interviews and stuff, mm-hmm. when you write all that, you've lived through a ton by talking with people for more than just the reason of, you know, how's the weather? Like you've yes. done this. So, so when you do this and now here you are now, how do you think this whole process has changed you as a person as before you had started it? Oh, I know how it's changed me. Um, back in the day when I was first training all of these super cool techniques, I, I wouldn't say I had a chip on my shoulder, but I, didn't care how I came across because I knew I had expertise that I was teaching people and my whole goal was to help them. I wanted them to, when they deployed, I wanted them to be safe. I wanted them to be able to collect the most high value intelligence, keep this nation safe. It all for good intentions. However, I didn't care how I came across. Well, I'm a type A personality. I'm very directive. I'm a thinker. Um, and sometimes I can be a little insensitive. Sometimes I can be a little too direct. And so there's some feedback that I've got in life coupled with all of the stuff I now know where self-awareness, right, is the first step. And I think my life's journey has allowed me to become so much more self-aware and correct the behaviors that I should have corrected years ago. And so I benefit that way because I know now what to do and how to act and making sure I am expressing empathy because I can never reach my overall goal if it doesn't start there first. So I think that has been my huge lesson that I've learned. I also impart it onto all my clients and people who train with me is to take a deep dive into yourself, figure out your personality traits and preferences, know how your preferred modes of making decisions and communicating because all of that definitely and directly impacts your human-to-human interactions, all of your relationships. I think I answered your question. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I was going to ask you, preferred mode in in a um, decision-making scenario, mine, I think, is flipping a coin. Does that count? (laughs) That's a Gavin (laughs) mode. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. yeah, It's going to be a new one. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So I've got got tons of things. I I, I love some of the stories that you've got, and I don't know whether to go down the hands shelf route or the Game Boy route. What do you reckon? Oh, gee. <laughs> um, you, 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 you pick. Winner's choice, you know. You pick. Oh, okay. All right. Tell, tell us about the Game Boy. Mm-hmm. In The Game Boy was a Game Boy back in the day, and we used it as a polygraph machine, as a ruse, <laughs> um, because we didn't have access to polygraph machines. We didn't have access to anything back in the day. And just introducing this thought that, hey, this machine – right, can knows when I'm going to lie versus a human, right, because we tend to trust technology more than a human. (laughs) And just the pure mention of that would change people's thoughts and just say, oh, well, now I have to tell you the truth from one Game Boy, which was, you know, obviously just a Game Boy, and people didn't know. But um, And sometimes, you know, if you have another thing to get people to focus on, it will help them to say, you know what, the game is up. Why am I keep lying? Why do I can't keep this up? This is ridiculous. I'm going to be found out. I might as well be honest and open right now. And so, yeah, the Game Boy yeah, helped I, at one point. I do love that. Yeah, it, it, just, just as a prop and kind of, I think yeah. you need like kind of answered one question and you looked at him and went, you're lying. And his eyes were like, <laughs> his face was he panicked. Get that off me. Get that off me. I'll tell you the truth. Just take me off. <laughs> yes. Yes. It, oh, that was funny. I'll never forget the time, though, when I started learning Arabic because I heard it so much and the detainee had answered no. And I immediately launched into another question without the interpreter translating. And the detainee got so upset and he started screaming and yelling. And I'm like, Oh God, what did I do? And the interpreter's mm-hmm. like, he thinks you know Arabic and that you, <laughs> and that you lied to him because you didn't wait for me to translate. And I'm like, Oh wow. Lesson <laughs> learned, right? So yeah, mm-hmm. I had to explain that. Yeah, um, and, and I know that you've had your fair amount of challenges with detainees as well, with just just by being a female. Um, I mean, can you tell us a little bit about that? 
So one guy. yeah, absolutely can. And I, a lot of people think the same way is that being a female was really hard and it was actually quite the opposite. Being a female, I was a third gender, so that I didn't get any of um, this treatment like they were better than me or they didn't want to talk to me because that was an, a female in their culture. They knew that a female in American culture is completely different. We, had a di- we have a different role, right, in society, and they were fine with that. So when I went into interrogation, I wasn't a six-foot-four Marine. I was a five-foot-four female. Right. And I walked in with a smile every single time. And so they were taken off guard. They're like, what? Who is this? I had a rapport immediately. I was non-threatening. Um, I wasn't a female in their culture. So I think they were more interested in who I was and my role at Gitmo. And that just started a free flowing conversation. Yeah, and I mean, I, I know uh, because of all these stories that we've shared in the past and a lot, mm-hmm. a lot of the videos that we've done, I know how much you love sharing these in, this information. So I'm going to kind of mention your Facebook page, TCG Tribe, mm, yeah. because, yeah, for anybody loving that, it's well worth checking out because you've got loads of videos on there and they're absolutely brilliant. Thank you. And I also have some really super cool guests like yourself come on, and we talk about a lot of behavioral um, indicators, psychology, communication techniques. I had an expert in leadership, neural leadership last week. So that's a lot of good stuff. Brilliant. And are you still working on the fiction book? Are you, you had a concept for it? Was that a, a <laughs> yes. non-starter or is it, um, is it? No, I have two in the works right now. Yes. One takes place um, focused in Rhode Island and Block Island, where I'm from, and the other in Maine. And I pick them up and write in them, but oh, not yet. Not ready yet to <laughs> sorry, commit they're, they're it to. <laughs> yeah. I, I've jumped the gun with that one a bit. Have I? <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's a struggle. I am a nonfiction writer, so writing fiction was, ooh, it was very different. It is very different. So I'm still, it's very hard. It's very it's hard. It's difficult. Uh, it's so uh, difficult. <laughs> right. Because, it's it, you know, I always found with the nonfiction when you're writing true stories you're getting evidence and mm-hmm. facts and you're getting information from for me it's like police and yeah. courts and lawyers and doctors and all so it's all very and and i don't have to choose what the people do they do it yes exactly <laughs> but i will oh. say with the with the fiction part you can get a little bit of justice or a, a kind of you can wrap things up in a better way than what happens quite often in real life you know? Yeah, you do have that. Mm-hmm. Right, because quite yeah. often I find, man, there's no, there's not always a good ending. Quite often, very true. Mm, you know, yeah. so it's kind of a nice thing. You know, uh, so when we talk about politics, mm-hmm. or you know, without getting into names and places and all that stuff, <laughs> yeah, I imagine a lot of these uh, political leaders get a lot of this kind of training or support from people that do this for a living, like yourself, for instance. Should should we really believe politicians? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, Alan, I don't think they do get support or training from people like me and what we do. I think they should, but I don't believe they do. And even if you've had training, so say you hire me and I'm going to help you with your presence, your executive presence or your presence when you're giving your campaign speech or whatever. At the end of the day, if you're going to choose to lie, you're gonna, you're still gonna exhibit all of those deceptive behaviors. I can't teach you not to do it. Your body will and your words will deceive you. Can I teach you how to portray confidence? Absolutely. Can I teach you how to suppress cortisol and maintain that calmness and that confidence? Absolutely. And that comes with actually knowing how to move your body. But at the end of the day, if you're going to choose to deceive people, your body and your words will give you out every single time. When you do that, can you train someone to beat the polygraph, so to speak? Or, you know, because polygraphs still aren't really recognized by mm-hmm. courts in most jurisdictions. So how reliable is it and how, how much can you train someone to deceive it? Yeah. So a polygraph machine is not a lie detector, as people, most people think of it. It's a stress detector. And all it does is measure the physiological responses to stress. So that means I would have to think a thought that would create the stress, that would kick off the stress response system, exert my stress hormones, and of course, um, my heartbeat will increase, my pulse will increase, I may start to sweat, and all those other physiological signs that a polygraph measures. But that's all it measures. On the assumption that everybody gets stressed out when they lie, and they don't. 
There's two types of liars in the world. There's a regular liar, we call them. Those are the people who will get stress and have anxiety and fail a poly when they lie. But then there's the powerful liar. They're not good liars. I can catch them out like this, right, just listening to their words. But here's the difference. Their thoughts are different from a regular liar. They're not thinking, oh, what happens if I get caught? What are the consequences of this lie going to be? I'm so stressed. No. They're thinking, after I lie, I get a lot of money. I get to stay out of jail. I get revenge. Those thoughts do not make a person stress. Those thoughts, instead of kicking off that stress response system, may kick off a little dopamine. And so, therefore, if you put those types of people on a polygraph machine, they'll pass it every single time. Look at our nation's spies. We have Aldridge Ames, right? We have Anna Montez. They pass their polygraph exams every single year because they didn't stress out when they lied. And that's the simple thing. So I can't teach people how not to stress. That's probably going to happen when you lie and you'll fail your poly. There's breathing techniques you can do and all this other stuff to keep a calm mind. But at the end of the day, it really depends on your thoughts. And if I can't stop those thoughts in you, you're going to fail your poly. Yeah, I mean, they're only like 60 to 80% accurate at the best of times anyway. And, mm -hmm. and even with it, everything that goes on with it, with a polygraph machine, it, it's, it's still only, it, it's run and done by a human. It's the yes. polygraph examiner that you're against, not the machine. Exactly. And a lot of people don't realize that. But you and I both know that the, you get more information pre- and post-interview than what you do actually during the actual interview oh, itself. Yes. So, you know, I mean, when you were uh, um, at Gitmo, I mean, again, you, you know, you, you, a lot of the information came from the walk to the interrogation room, didn't it? Oh, absolutely, because they didn't assume I was interrogating because we weren't sitting in the chairs. I was walking with them from the prison to the Sally Ports up to the interrogation booths, and they were just happy, having a conversation. I was using elicitation, right? I collected so much valuable information. But then I got them into an environment that was dubbed the interrogation room, and they had to sit in a chair, and everything became different. Yeah, so it's always thinking about that environment, physical, right? I want it physically comforting and emotionally. Yeah, and on you on, on TV with something at the minute? Is there a show you've got going on? Which one? Yes, it finally came out. I'm super excited. It's Killer Performance, and it's on Reels and Peacock. And myself with Mark Bowden and Jana, oh, I forget her last name. Um, Jana is the psychologist, former FBI, Mark Bowden, body language expert, myself, and the three of us analyze killers. Ooh, yeah. That sounds interesting. Mm -hmm. And it, we go through everything because you look at the tapes of when they were out in the world saying, oh, it couldn't possibly be me. You know, I didn't do this stuff. And then afterwards, we find out they did do this stuff. I'm definitely wow. going to be checking that out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Gavin, yeah. you're going to have to stay low for a while. <laughs> <laughs> right. You'll be in trouble. Okay. I know where to find them. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but do you know where to find the bodies? <laughs> that I do not. No. Uh, it, won't, it won't take long. He'll break. <laughs> <laughs> Just use some well. hesitation. Yeah, some solicitation. <laughs> yeah, that's what I, that's what I do. You know, so. I don't know about you, but when I meet uh, killers in prison, like when I've gone and met and yeah. done the interviews for a book or something, um, I always find there it's it's never like you see on TV. Um, mm -hmm. As in, they're never Hannibal Lecter. They're not all of that. They're just kind of normal people, so to speak. Not not normal because of what they've done, but I mean they just seem pretty average. Like they don't have super intelligence for the most part, or they're not. Uh, like I said, it's not sitting in there with Hannibal Lecter for myself, anyway. Yeah, um, no, definitely not. <laughs> definitely mean. not. So in Killer Performance, we assess Chris Watts. That's not a Hannibal Lecter. Uh, John Wayne Gacy, right now. Ted Bundy, however, now you're talking true psychopath. Um, there was Drew Peterson. Yeah. They're not smart because you want to know why? They're all in prison. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. There's very sel seldom that they're superstars like that. They make it kind of, but it's kind of portrayed that way. Mm -hmm. anyway, it is. It? It's Hollywood. Yeah, yeah of course. Mm -hmm. Glam, makeup, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, listen, this has been a thrill. So how how do people find you? This, what What is your website and what social media platforms do you use that readers or fans can get a hold of you? 
Sure. So my website is just my company's name. It's thecongruencygroup.com. You can find me on LinkedIn, just Lena Cisco. And um, Gavin mentioned my Facebook group, which is TCG. It just stands for The Congruency Group Tribe. Well, fantastic. Now we're going to put that up on our website along yeah. with your book. People, you need to buy it. Honest <laughs> answers. Mm. This is interview and negotiation skills to get to the truth. So, you know, afterwards we're going to be filming our intake interrogation of Gavin and <laughs> <laughs> it'll be up on YouTube. No, I love it. Kidding. Well, we appreciate you being here and thank you. Lena, thank you Cisco. so much, so- Alan, for having me. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.